Hello, everyone. Welcome to our town hall. We're just going to wait a minute as we get all of our attendees into our meeting. Um, our numbers are going up quite a bit right now. Okay. Hi, my name is Tara Strickland. I am in the Office of Marketing and Communications, and I'd like to welcome you to today's town hall, which uh, is going to discuss the reopening of Georgian Court for our students and their families. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce <coughs> the president, his cabinet, and other members of our leadership team. We have Dr. Joseph Marbach, president, Dr. Janice Warner, provost, Amani Jennings, dean of students, Yale Towns, Executive Director of Marketing and Communications, Stephanie Rayhill, Associate Professor of Psychology and Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, Chris Kozak, uh, Vice President for Enrollment Management, Matt Manfra, Vice President for Institutional Advancement, Amy Basio, she's our CFO and Vice President for Finance Administration, and Dr. Paul DePonte, who is our Executive Assistant um, Sorry, I had to get this right. Executive Director of Mission Integration and Special Assistant to the President. And he is going to start us off today with a reflection. Thanks, Tara. As we know, Georgian Court is a mercy school. It was founded by and bears the charism of the Sisters of Mercy in the great tradition of their founder, Catherine McCauley. As we begin this town hall event, I'd like to share two sayings attributed to Catherine McCauley, which I believe can inspire and encourage us as we approach the beginning of another academic year in challenging circumstances. The first one, which is really quite beautiful in its simplicity, reminds us of what is at the heart of Mercy Education, the importance of belonging and community. Catherine is remembered for the simple observation, the tender mercy of God has given us one another. I don't know when Catherine said this or what was the context, but to me it sounds like an answer to a question someone might have asked. Here's the question I sense was behind it. I think someone probably asked her, how are we going to get through this? How are we ever going to get this done? And I think Catherine's answer to that question was, well, the tender mercy of God has given us one another. She may have had to say it often. Georgian Court is the kind of university where relationships matter and where learning as persons in relation makes all the difference. We promote a values-based learning environment which highlights the importance of interconnectedness and interdependence. We strive to uphold Catholic social teaching on the common good, a vision which runs counter to the radical individualism and egoism so prevalent in our time. We also have a 112 year history of upholding our mission, even during times of crisis and challenge. Wars, economic recessions, the Great Depression, even a previous pandemic. GCU endured through hardship precisely because of its confidence in God, who calls us in mercy to care for one another. The present challenges that we face should make it clear that our vision of community and shared responsibility are more important than ever. In the coming academic year, however and wherever it occurs, even the smallest acts performed thoughtfully, washing hands, wearing masks, maintaining safe distance, remaining patient, 
all of these acts will uphold our core values and satisfy our mission if done in the spirit of service. I mentioned that I had two sayings of Catherine that I wanted to share with you, but this second one is so straightforward, I'll let it speak for itself. Thank you all. I'd like to introduce Dr. Joseph Marbach, president of the university to speak next. Thank you, Tara. And Paul, thank you for uh, that reflection. Catherine, obviously much more eloquent if someone asked me, how, how are we going to get through this? I simply would have said together. Um, and Paul reminds us that in this time of pandemic, we indeed are our brothers and sisters keepers. And that's the spirit um, with which we come to you today to give you some ideas about our, our plans for the university and for the fall semester. Um, and as we move forward, how they'll unfold and how they'll be subject to change based on the uh, conditions that we find ourselves uh, working under. Uh, throughout the summer, uh, we have convened three working groups to examine how we might be able to uh, bring our students back to campus, how we might ensure that they have an exceptional student experience under certain circumstances, and how we operate as, as a university and as, as a business, as a place of work. Um, we'll hear today from the chairs of uh, those three committees, uh, Provost Janice Warner, who's directed the academic side uh, of the work groups, and she'll be joined by Dr. Stephanie Rahill, who is the director of our Center for Teaching and Learning. We'll also hear from Dean of Students, Amani Jennings, uh, who's been working on uh, the residence hall issues, student life issues, um, and the general campus climate. And then finally, we'll hear from uh, Vice President Amy Basio, our CFO, who will also talk about the larger environment in which the faculty, staff, and administrators will find themselves and, and the impact that that will have on uh, our students and, and the uh, learning experience they have. So I do want to uh, thank students and their family members for joining us today uh, to learn more about what our plans are. Um, as we go through, many of you have already submitted questions and Tara will take some time after the presentations to uh, read those questions and direct it to the appropriate cabinet member. We also have a question and answer uh, feature on this webinar that you can go in and type your question and get a direct answer from uh, one of the members of my staff. And I also believe we have a raise your hand uh, option during this time uh, so that we can turn questions directly over to individual members of our audience at that point. So uh, given that, uh, I'll turn it over now to the uh, provost of the university, Dr. Janice Warner. Thank you, President Marbach. First of all, um, thank you students for participating in this um, event. We're really, we, we really hope that you're excited to continue your education and we're trying to find the best way to do that. Would you go to the slides, Tara? So uh, way back in May, <laughs> um, and maybe even a little bit before that, we were looking at how the spring semester went and did send out a survey to students, not so much to, to get um, a rating of how classes were, but instead to find out what were the stumbling blocks and how could we um, continue providing our classes in the best way possible. And so we've used that survey and the many wonderful comments that students provided to help prepare us for the fall. Um, we had hoped, of course, back in May that fall would be a lot like last fall, but um, as we know, things haven't progressed quite as fast as any, anybody would hope. So we do know that we have certain constraints, and what, what our goal is, is to continue to provide students with an excellent academic experience, but in a safe environment. And so some of the things that we've been um, focused on in preparing are one, to set up classroom spaces in larger areas 
so that we can have safe distances between students and between students and faculty members. We are also limiting our in-person class sessions to small groups. And so typically that is gonna be uh, nine students and a faculty member. There are some, some rare cases where it might be slightly higher than that. We are also um, getting ready to be, to be flexible. So in the spring, we suddenly had to go from a mainly in-person situation to one that was completely online without any preparation. Well, now we've had time to prepare and we have been preparing. And so we know we're going to have a very um, good set of classes and we know that we're gonna be able to be much more flexible. And um, right now the state is in stage two and we can't do significant online classes until we reach stage three. We do have a waiver for our nursing program and they are already this summer conducting some classes in a flexible manner where there is some in-person components to their classes. But otherwise, we generally um, would have to, if we were to start classes right now, we would have to be online. When um, the state goes to stage three, and we were assuming it would be by August 24th, we would go to uh, a, a partially in-person environment. And I'm gonna be explaining that in the next few slides. But again, it's dependent on New Jersey's road back stage, as well as local conditions. So in that stage three plan, we do wanna have in-person classes. And so for those where in-person classes best meet their learning styles, in-person sessions will be available. However, for those of you where in-person um, concerns you because of underlying health conditions or just uncertainty about the risks that it might um, have, you are also able to continue in your classes even if they were originally scheduled as in-person classes um, and continue in those classes remotely. So that's also part of our flexibility. So basically we're having a mix of high flex, virtual and online, and I'm gonna explain those three terms in the next few slides. So high flex. High flex is a model where all course content and assignments are available fully online. So this allows both students to determine that if they can't come to class, either for part of the semester or the whole semester, they can continue to progress in their classes online. However, if they can come to class and, and they, they, they benefit from an in-person session, which most of our students do, um, they are able to go to in-person sessions, but they'll be in smaller groups. So um, in many cases, classes will be broken into two groups and half the students will come at one time and the other half will come at another time. And this will all be um, communicated by faculty members. So the reason that we're doing high flex is really to protect the campus community. We want to make sure that there is no incentive to come to campus if you shouldn't be here. So we wanna encourage those who feel that they may po pose a risk to others to stay away, or if um, it's best for your health to, to stay away from contact of any sort, then certainly we wanna provide you the opportunity to continue to take classes while staying away from campus. The in-person session, sessions will address issues for students that learn best in the classroom. So it provides direct access and engagement with the faculty member and with other students. Um, it's a place where student, faculty can use some of the skills that they, they have long developed you know, to show, to demonstrate, or to have in-person discussions or address questions in person. And um, these sessions can be used to enhance understanding so that you know, through the interactions with students and with faculty members, um, students may get a better understanding. But again, if you're not able to come to these sessions, you will be able to get all the material that you need 
um, online. In-person sessions can also be helpful for those who um, have technology issues. So technology is available for those who need it um, through our angel fund. But um, you know, for all of us, there are sometimes glitches in our technology. I, I, I know there's, there's been numerous times where you're in a video conference and it just gets frustrating because you can't hear everybody perfectly or you don't feel like you can answer, ask a question so easily. So by having these in-person sessions, that should help um, the situations for many students. Okay, but as I said several times now, but stu students may still opt to stay online even when there is an in-person component. So that is absolutely something that you can do. The, the thing is though, that students need to keep in contact with the faculty. So faculty will be expecting and will set out in their syllabi how it is you should engage with the class. And in order to show that you are participating in the class and so that they can report attendance um, for you. So faculty will communicate when you should attend class in person if you're going to do that as the class may be divided into groups. And likewise, if you're not able to come to an in-person session, you're obligated to tell your faculty member so that they know not to look for you or how they need to communicate with you if you're not able to come. And in some cases, we've actually in, in all cases in the classroom, we've put recording and streaming devices. And so fa some faculty will use these devices and may give access to in-person sessions to um, students who are not there. But other in other classes, that won't happen just because of how faculty are using the in-person time. Um, Dr. Rahill will be explaining a little bit about flipped classrooms. And so sometimes the in-person session doesn't make sense um, to stream. It's really for the people participating. And so you will see a variety of things, and that's why it's really important to go onto Blackboard and understand how the faculty member is going to conduct their class and how you would participate. So that's High Flex, which includes an in-person piece. On your schedule, the way you'll know that a class is High Flex is first of all, it will be indicated as a hybrid class. And so I'm pointing to the schedule part. Um, it will have days and times associated with it. And it will have a room number associated with it. This example actually doesn't show the room because we haven't assigned it yet, but it does show that the campus is Georgian Court. And so if the campus is Georgian Court, then you know there will be a room assigned and that at least um, some portion of that scheduled time, you'll be invited to an in-person session. You absolutely need to go on Black Blackboard before classes start and see what the direction is from your professor as far as when you should attend. So this is actually the class I'm gonna be teaching. I am gonna be teaching a class in the fall and um, it was originally scheduled as a fa fully face-to-face -face class on Mondays and Wednesdays from 9.30 to 10.45. And what I'm going to do is break the class into two groups and half the class will come on Monday during the scheduled time and half the class will come on Wednesday during the scheduled time. And, and so all of your professors are going to do something similar and tell you that. And it will, it will be on Blackboard that they tell you that. Would you move to the next slide? OK, for online classes, there are two different types of online classes. Online classes um, that were originally scheduled as online classes um, will be just as they always were. You engage with the course material on your own time. There are deadlines, there are schedules, but there isn't a time period where you have to be online with your class. For classes that weren't originally going to be online classes, we've created something different called virtual classes. These virtual classes are online classes, but they have days and times when all students will log on to Blackboard Collaborate um, their, the video conferencing tool associated with Blackboard to attend the class together virtually. So you are expected to be in that class session, if at all possible. 
again, if, if there's some reason that you can't make it, you would contact your professor and, and discuss it with them. So in the, in the, um, in the first, um, in the first example, so online class. So I'm sorry, the first example, the um, Gen 400 lecture section 31, which you see on the, the very left, um, that is a virtual class. So you see a day and time associated with it. It's Wednesdays at 1230. So that's when you're expected to attend class by logging on to, uh, to collaborate and participating in the class. You can tell that it's virtual because it says virtual in the very last column under schedule. It does say it's online, but it says it's virtual and it has days and times associated with it. You know it's not on campus because it does say off campus and there's no room. In the second example, this is a fully online class, meaning that there are no um, there is no days and times. Um, you're just expected to engage with the material on your own time. But again, you have to remember to meet all due dates and engage with the material. So that's watch the videos, read the PowerPoints, do the assignments. Um, very important. And if um, a faculty member you know, uh, has office hours or something like that, you can also engage with them there. Can you move to the next slide? Just one moment, having a little bit of technical difficulty again. That's okay. I think um, I'm actually gonna be passing it off to Dr. Rahill, who will explain a little bit more about all the preparation that faculty have put into making the fall semester successful. Um, but the most important thing for you to remember is that you need to engage. If you have any questions, you need to contact your faculty member. If you have trouble contacting the faculty members, then you can reach out to the department chairs, the program directors, and ultimately the dean. Thank you, Dr. Rahel. Okay, hello everyone. So as uh, Dr. Warner mentioned, I am uh, the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. I'm also a full-time faculty member um, and I teach in the psychology department and in the graduate program for school psychology. Um, in my role as um, the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, I have been working with faculty all summer to try to provide support, professional development, gather resources so that we could all plan to have the most successful uh, fall semester as possible. So as Dr. Warner was saying, the classes are all going to be high flex, which at this, if we are able to move to phase three, if the state moves to phase three. Um, in this high flex course design, I wanted to show you just one example of a course design on Blackboard because all faculty will be using Blackboard for their courses. So that is where students will be going to find their course content. So this is one of my own courses that I'll be teaching in the fall. Um, and the way I have each week divided is that the students will see activities that they need to complete prior to coming to class. Um, and so they will click in that folder and I've labeled exactly what I want them to do prior to coming to class. Then we would have our in-class activities for our small groups that are able to meet in class together. And each week, of course, those would be different depending on the weekly goals for the class. But because it's high flex, any student that can't attend in person would be able to do an alternative set of um, Get, get an alternative way to access the material. So in that second folder, if you can see it, I'm detailing this is what our plan is if you're in class. And if you're not in class, this is what you should be doing. And this is how we'll interact. And then finally, all students, whether or not they were able to attend the in-class session, they would have an after-class activity. Um, and in my class, that would mean a weekly assignment submission because that's demonstrating to me that they understand that course content for the week. Okay, so then the next slide I believe is now also showing a sample of what might be in a syllabus. 
Um, and again, this is my personal syllabus, but I've been sharing it with faculty and other, we've, um, other faculty have been sharing their samples so that we could all um, gather ideas from one another. So as Dr. Warner was saying, um, in a hybrid class, some of the sessions would be face-to-face -face in class. Some uh, weeks it might be virtual, which would mean we would be planning to um, have a synchronous session on Blackboard Collaborate Together. And in my classes, there'll be a few weeks where they, it, the students can do online work in an asynchronous fashion. So this is what would be in my syllabus. Um, and then on the next slide, it also shows um, what that syllabus calendar for this particular course might look like. So if you see in the date column, as I'm giving the dates and the weeks, I'm also saying what our modality is for instruction. So which weeks we meet in class, which weeks we meet virtually, which means they're gonna log on to Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, during our class time. And then there's one or two weeks throughout this particular um, class semester that they can just work online with their materials asynchronously. And again, this is just one example, but these are the materials that I've been sharing with faculty in terms of how to set up the course design. And, and we've also been talking about, well, what types of activities make most, the most sense for the different types of modalities? So we've been discussing that all summer. And then on the next slide, um, just want to reiterate that we will be using uh, Blackboard Learn. All faculty will be um, posting the course syllabus and the course content on Blackboard. So if you are new to Blackboard, if you're new to the university, you should try to become familiar with Blackboard and its features. Um, prior to the semester, the stu students get access to Blackboard courses two weeks before the semester starts typically. Um, certain faculty might not be ready to show the specific content um, two weeks before, so they might shut it off until everything is ready, but you at least then would be able to be exploring around the course sites. Students are also all enrolled in the student technology resources on Blackboard. Um, so that's a separate Blackboard group that offers all types of tips and instructions for how to navigate Blackboard. Um, so you should definitely take a look at that and make sure you understand um, all of the resources that are available and your faculty might be using on Blackboard. And then all of the virtual sessions will take um, place that the faculty do straight through Blackboard. So we have a feature called Collaborate, uh, which is a Zoom type, like Zoom-like type um, video conferencing and faculty will be scheduling the virtual sessions on that. Uh, collaborate. The next screen just shows you an example um, or a screenshot of that student technology resource, resources on Blackboard. And I put up this screenshot specifically of how to use that collaborate. So, and you can see it along the left side that there's all different types of resources for understanding how to navigate with Blackboard. And then on uh, the next slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how um, we have been talking all summer about how to in, ensure that we have effective student faculty engagement. Um, the faculty want to be engaged with students. We know that you know, when we're with students face to face, that's the easiest, but that doesn't mean we can't have effective communication if we have to be virtual. So all faculty will be doing virtual office hours uh, throughout the semester and they'll be posting when their virtual office hours are right in the syllabus. So I would definitely recommend as students that you drop in on those sessions. It'll be set up just like it would be if you were in person and you wanted to go to your faculty's office to discuss any type of academic concern or issue that you're having. So you, I definitely recommend that you attend those um, office hours. And then of course, we want our students to be fully participating in the Blackboard Collaborate sessions. So if you can take, you know, try to make sure that your technology is going to work, that you have volume, that you have video, so that you can be fully engaged in that Collaborate experience. Um, and you know, different faculty will be doing different things in terms of how to increase that engagement. One thing I personally am gonna be doing is I'll be having little drop-in sessions to say, um, I'm gonna be discussing in more depth for 15 minutes how we're gonna do this one assignment. 
because what we know is that I could write out all the instructions for the assignment in my syllabus, but typically in class when I go to explain it and that, you know, I give examples and students ask questions, you end up getting a better understanding of what the expectations are. So I might just add in a couple drop in sessions where I'm going to be talking about how to do this paper. Come if you can. I'll record it if you can't so that you'll see what that discussion was. So you'll see your faculty doing different types of things like that so that you can be as engaged as possible. And then the last two slides here is just to make sure um, that, that you all are aware that uh, we have been working all, all summer really to um, try to make sure that our course design can be as effective as possible. As Dr. Warner mentioned, in the um, spring, we sort of were just thrown into virtual instruction and you know, faculty had to make the changes to their courses very quickly. So now we've had um, a lot of time this summer to talk about effective instruction. Uh, we've talked a lot about things like flipped course design um, and how do we make the best use of the time that we actually have um, in class. <laughs> so there, there's also been a lot of planning about what are the multiple ways that we can assess student learning. Um, does it always have to be a traditional test? What are other ways that would be effective ways to make sure that students understand this, the course content? So there's been a lot of uh, planning that's gone into our summer work to have um, very effective fall classes. We also have another office of instructional technology and they've been doing professional development for faculty all summer long about the different uh, technology resources they can use to be more effective with their course design. And the last thing we, we're, we've been doing, which I think is the next slide, um, is really collaborating with one another as faculty. So um, we're doing um, this feature, which we call the Innovative Practices Spotlight, where faculty are basically just writing in or sending videos that gets posted for other faculty about things that worked really well and our ideas or tips of how to uh, foster student engagement or teach content. So it's kind of like a what worked, what didn't, um, so that faculty can all learn from one another um, to do better in, this, in the fall semester with our course design. And I think that's it for me, yep. Thank you, Dr. Rayhill. I'd like to now introduce Amani Jennings, our Dean of Students. Good afternoon, students and families. I'm going to briefly walk through the general campus experience along with some expectations that we will have for the student body. Um, so general campus experience, face coverings are required when on campus, whether you are indoors or outdoors, face coverings are required. Um, and this will be a change. This has been in addition to our student code of conduct. Um, so just please keep that in mind. Um, that face coverings is not optional, it is required when you are on campus. For those of you who are resident students, you also must wear face coverings when inside your resident halls. Of course, with the exception of when you're inside of your assigned room, but hallways, bathrooms, laundry, you name it, those other locations, face masks are required as well. Social distancing must be maintained at all times. Um, and what does social distancing mean? I think at this point we all can, can, uh, can say this um, as we've seen it and heard it in many spaces, but to practice social or physical distancing, stay at least six feet, um, about two arms length from other people who are not from your household. So essentially, in addition to the face mask, you have to also um, stay at least six feet away from those who are around you. Daily screening will be required through an online questionnaire. Our, our IT department is working vigorously to prepare a, um, an online questionnaire. Um, this will be completed on a daily basis. And um, based on the responses, your responses on this questionnaire, that will determine whether or not you're uh, permitted to come to campus or whether you are instructed not to come to campus and contact your uh, primary health care physician. Our nursing department, along with our health services department, are working on the questions. Um, and they're all related to, you know, if you've had contact with someone who's tested positive, have you tested positive, those types of things. Um, so be prepared to, to complete that online survey 
um, honestly on a daily basis. Um, again, this is just another way that we are um, doing, doing what we can to keep our, our campus uh, COVID-19 free. Um, student activities, um, regardless of what stage we're in, one, two, or three, um, we will be um, conducting the bulk of our student activities virtually. Um, there are just too many restrictions on how we can gather folks together. And today, um, the governor came up with some um, came out with some new guidelines and restrictions on on public gatherings. Um, so we will be looking to have the bulk of our um, campus activities and programming um, done virtually. Um, but if we are at stage three, which is, uh, is the most open that we can get, we will have what limited on-campus programming we can um, and as safely as we can. Um, commuter students. Commuter students who may have, who have tested positive for COVID-19 or who have had direct contact with someone who has tested positive should contact health services and should not come to campus. Um, at, any, at any time, you can always contact your own primary health care provider if you have questions, and you probably should do that anyway. Uh, but our health services office is available for questions as well. They can um, walk you through um, and, and advise you on what is the best um, steps you should take should you have questions or concerns about your level of contact with someone who has or may have tested positive. Um, so please make sure to consider health services a constant and regular resource for all of your, all of your health related questions and especially your COVID-19 related questions. Um, but again, commuters who have tested positive should not come to campus and should contact health services. Resident students who have tested positive um, for COVID-19 or who have had direct contact with someone who has tested positive our first ask is for you to return home. If you're able to return home, um, we're gonna ask that you do that, mainly because we have limited quarantine space on campus. And so um, if a student is, a, is tested positive or has had contact with someone who has, our first ask is that you return home. If you cannot return home for whatever reason, then we will of course um, house you in, in some of the designated quarantine or isolation spaces that we have on campus. Um, so we are prepared um, in, the, in the event that a student, a resident student, does test positive or who has had direct contact with someone who has. Um, enhanced cleaning will take place throughout the campus, classrooms, bathrooms, and in the resident halls. Um, and I know that our CFO is going to go into much greater detail with that in the next presentation. And students, again, with questions, any questions or concerns, should always contact our health services department. Next slide. Classroom experience. These are the expectations that GCU has of you when you enter the classroom. Arrive no sooner than five minutes before the in-person class is scheduled to begin. We do not want people to be passing each other in and out of the classroom. Depart the classroom immediately once the session is over. If you are having a conversation with a fellow student or professor, Invite them outside. Seating areas will be available um, and there will be indoor spaces available for social distanced um, in-person meetings as well. Um, so we, again, we are identifying outdoor spaces and indoor spaces um, that allow meetings to occur um, while maintaining social distancing guidelines. Always wear full cloth or disposable face covering and it needs to cover your mouth and your nose. Again, this is not um, optional, this is a requirement. Do not approach the professor. If a private conversation is needed, reach out to make an appointment. And by reach out primarily, um, if you can't ask the question in class, then reach out through phone or uh, virtually through an email. Maintain social distancing at all times in the classrooms. You're gonna see stickers on certain seats instructing you not to sit there. We're gonna ask that you, that you uh, follow that because those stickers are there to enable us to make sure that students are staying um, six feet apart from each other. Wipe down your desk and chair before and after class, dispose of cleaning wipes in appropriate bins and use hand sanitizer before class. We are, going, we are uh, providing um, cleaning products and hand sanitizers, um, particularly in the classroom areas, so that in addition to the enhanced cleaning that was gonna take place or take part um, with our housekeeping and facilities crew, 
Um, there will be opportunities for students, staff, and faculty to clean their own spaces with some of the cleaning products that will be left in those spaces. Next slide. For those of you who are resident students who are in, or who are interested in the residential experience, um, at no stage, one, two, or three of the state's plans are we permitted to occupy our resident halls 100% occupancy. So we are gonna be limiting on-campus housing in whatever stage we are in. And our goal is to stay um, at 65% occupancy. In the event um, that New Jersey further restricts capacity within resident halls, if they take us back to stage one, um, or if we don't get to stage three, then we will have to further de-densify our resident halls even lower than 65%. So just please keep that in mind um, that there is a chance um, and we're hoping it's an unlikely chance that we may have to further de-densify our resident halls more than we already have. Um, as much as possible, students are being placed in single rooms. Um, again, as per state guidance, visitation within the resident halls is gonna be limited for the duration of the fall 2020 semester. As I mentioned, there will be enhanced cleaning that's gonna take place throughout the resident halls. Face coverings are required, again, except for when you're in your assigned room. Lounges and community kitchens will be closed or have limited access. Um, there are some lounges that just don't have doors and simply cannot be locked, but we are looking to, to limit access in these, in these spaces, again, based on state guidance. Students requiring quarantine or isolation as I mentioned, will first be asked to return home. If unable to return home, students will be placed in designated quarantine or isolation space. There will be food delivery for these students, trash disposal for these students. Um, so we will be able to accommodate the needs that these students have. Um, and again, we do have quarantine space available for those students who are unable to go home. If you've been keeping up with the governor's daily press conferences, you know that there is an ever-growing list of states that are designated as hot zones. Um, and when you enter the state of New Jersey from any of these locations, you have to quarantine for a 14-day period. We are providing um, quarantine space to students coming from any of those locations or coming from an international location. I think the Office of Residence Life at this point has been in contact um, to some degree with those students, um, but just be aware that we are offering quarantine for those students that for a 14 day period um, at no additional room and board charge um, for those students coming from an out of state hot zone, designated hot zone location, or coming from an international location. If you have any questions about that, I would suggest that you contact the Office of Residence Life immediately. And um, a quick note on our return to athletics, as some of you may know, um, through a decision made by the Central Athletic, Central Atlantic Collegiate Conference President's Council, the CACC will not compete in intercollegiate athletics until after December 31st, 2020. So there will be no fall or winter sports until after January the 1st, 2021. There will be no preseason for the fall 2000 sports. All student athletes will be able to move in to the resident halls, those, of the, those student athletes who are residents, along with the general residential student body. All coaches, administrators, staff, and student athletes will participate in mandatory training on policies and protocols for preventing the spread of the virus. Detailed plans will be approved by the university's team physician Dr. Christina Lusk. All student athletes will go through me full medical review by sports medicine staff and the university's team physician. Team conditioning and practices will have a phased in start with guidance from state, NCAA, and CACC recommendations. Utilizing NCAA Division II non-championship season practice perimeters and further limiting them to eight hours a week of team activities. And lastly, mandatory self-health screenings and temperature checks will be done daily prior to any athletic activity. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Amani. And uh, now I would like to introduce Amy Basio, our CFO, who will talk about our general university operations as we reopen. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We could go to the next slide. First thing I wanted to do was to give you an update on the CARES Act um, student assistance uh, program. So the uh, government uh, awarded various institutions a sum of money to support their students through this difficult time and expenses that they had incurred because of the COVID pandemic. So uh, the university was awarded for students assistance $845,000. And to date, we've distributed about $800,000. And of those students who applied for assistance, which you um, could have done on the um, COVID-19 website of the university, approximately 80% of those students received funding. Um, the GCU Angel Fund, if not everyone is aware of it, it provides emergency support to about 30 families, uh, students, I'm sorry, annually. And uh, that number increased to 58 in the spring through April. 283 students have sought, assist have sought assistance since March. And I think the even more powerful um, uh, concept behind the Angel Fund was since this past March, more than $30,000 have been raised for the Angel Fund with gifts ranging from $5 to several thousand dollars. And that truly is, I think, part of the Mercy mission. Uh, and I think this speaks very um, directly to that. Next slide. Social distancing and PPE. Um, I know you'll hear this a lot more and you'll uh, continue to hear this throughout the year that um, we will provide residents and commuter students that will receive an initial supplies for personal use and then are asked to provide subsequent personal supplies. Um, we are working with the bookstore. Uh, if you run out of disposable masks or cloth masks, we are working with the bookstore to get uh, masks as well as hand sanitizer in uh, so that you have it should you run out in an emergency on campus. And campus visitors will absolutely be required, provide their own supplies or have supplies provided for them by the hosting individual or department. Face coverings are required to be worn by everyone in public settings. Now, what are public settings? So all campus grounds, library, classrooms, conference rooms, hallways, restrooms. The only two exceptions are when you are in your own room in a residence hall. And then if um, this mainly uh, uh, applies to staff, if there's an office that's occupied more than one person. So except for when you're in your own room in the residence hall, you need to have a mask. Uh, there'll be training for students um, before through the Office of Residence Life be before returning to campus. And uh, the one thing I think brings us together as a community is individuals who do, who's, who do not uh, comply with social distancing and other COVID protocols will be and can be asked to leave the classroom, the office, or other campus location. We hope we don't have to um, employ this, but um, it's important for everyone, for yourself, for your faculty, for your family members that, um, that we use proper protocols when uh, dealing with this uh, virus. Next. So I'd like to say by keeping your mask on, we can keep our doors open. Next. Screening, testing, and tracing. So um, Dean Jennings talked a bit about this. There's an electronic, there will be an electronic daily health screening tool that will be implemented before you return to campus. Um, we're hoping by then that we'll have an app for you to use, download be both uh, iOS and, and Android. Um, if not, uh, there will be um, 
a link that we will send you where you would log in every day, answer a, a certain set of questions. Um, and those daily health screenings must be done every day by individuals, either before their arrival to campus, so if you're a commuter student, or before you leave your residence hall if you're a resident student. So a negative screen uh, occurs when you answer no to every question. Have you, um, you know, traveled outside of the country in the past 30 days? Do you have a temperature over 100.4? I think you're probably all familiar with those questions. So if you answer no to all of those questions, then you have a negative screen and you're free to be present on campus. Um, and at times you may be, while on campus, asked to show your screening results. How do you get your result? You will either get an email uh, or a text that will tell you whether you've passed the screen or not. And so you're, you're able to show um, that you have actually completed the screening. Um, the resident student needs to call health services and residence life if they um, do not get a, a, a a good screening or if there's an answer of yes to any one of the questions. And then again, if you're a commuter student, um, as Dean uh, Jennings said, remain at home, call your primary care physician, and especially call the Office of Human um, of Health Services for any further instructions. Uh, tracing will be done by the Ocean County Health Department. So once uh, we have identified that there is a positive test on campus, then we will alert the Ocean County Health Department and then they in turn will do the contact tracing starting by interviewing the person who uh, has tested positive and then uh, depending on the nature of who's tested positive, there may be other members of the community who may be asked to um, quarantine and self-monitor so it could be um, classmates, it could be residence advisors, it could be faculty. Um, if you have an on-campus job, it could be those uh, in offices that you work with. Uh, and the students uh, who are, will be quarantined, uh, as Dean Jennings said, there's the opportunity potentially to uh, do that in the residence halls. Next slide, please. Um, so building access, building and space access. Again, we're asking everyone before you get to campus to do the screening. We're going to limit access points to the campus. So uh, in limiting visitors and in promoting uh, health and safety for our, our campus community. So the, the less entry points to the campus, the safer we will be because then you'll be going from, an, from the outside, you'll be going through the security gate. You will show that for commuter students, staff and faculty alike, show that you've had that, um, you've done your proper screening, you passed and you can go further on to campus. And we're asking that the students must display their hang tags visibly because that uh, gives us uh, an additional visual cue that you belong on campus. Next. Buildings. Uh, some. The buildings we've revised to open from 6 a.m. and close at 10 p.m. I believe before maybe um, Jeffries and the library may have been opened a bit later, uh, but for right now, when students come back, we're in stage three, we're looking at these particular hours. If there's a need uh, to open up the buildings, any particular building for a longer period of time, then we'll certainly take that into consideration given the building usage. Um, if for any reason you need to uh, go to the offices on Lakewood Avenue, those uh, buildings are uh, card access only and will remain so. Uh, we'll have specific entrances and exits marked uh, on buildings that um, are able to do, uh, that we're able to do that on those buildings. And of course, they will all continue to be handicap accessible. Next. We will have signage, directional signage in hallways and repeated signage reminding people to socially distance. So um, we'll have plexiglass dividers for cashier stations and the financial aid registrar's office. We've put in a glass, plexiglass window. Uh, occupancy limited just to one person. Um, any 
offices or areas, departments that require queuing in line. So if you're in the dining hall in Raymond, Raymond Hall will be open, um, but there will be markings on the floor that say, don't forget to socially distance, and those markings would be six feet apart to give you um, an estimate of how to socially distance properly with those visual cues. And um, well, so I mentioned earlier that large public or externally sponsored campus events are not permitted. So we talked about the tape on the floor. So what we're in, in Jeffrey's Hall, for example, we would have uh, students going one way in one direction uh, on the first floor and then the up staircase and then the other direction and the down staircase. I don't know, I think that's the, um, one of the few buildings that we could do, do that in, but where possible, we will put uh, directional markers. In the classrooms, the chairs will be set six feet apart from each other, the desks, but the, um, there will also be markings on uh, the desks if, to not use them. So if you've seen them, if you've been in a doctor's office or another public area where they mark off almost every other or every third chair that you can't sit, we'll be using those visual cues as well. And the faculty will have a space that's taped off in the front of the classroom. Um, so that uh, provides uh, social distancing uh, for the professor and for you both. Um, Non-classroom spaces may be used for additional classroom space. So in order to de-densify, we're getting very creative as to how to use non-traditional classrooms um, to, uh, to uh, have our students um, still meet, but in uh, some interior locations that haven't been used for classroom space before. And the uh, computer labs will also have reduced capacity uh, due to social distancing. Next. Cleaning protocols. So what the university has had to do is reallocate its resources from its daily um, cleaning plan uh, we have recently, effectively July 1st, partnered with Aramark for both our facilities and our dining services, and we've been working on the transition with them since May, and they've been great partners in helping us design and, uh, and uh, create cleaning programs that are appropriate in this time of COVID-19. So, um, the classrooms will be cleaned and uh, there will be in between the cleanings, we will have supplemental housekeeping services, um, otherwise known as porters. So you will see individuals with our mark shirts on walking through the buildings, um, sanitizing uh, door handles and light switches, uh, faucets in the restrooms. Uh, the restrooms in academic buildings will have two visits um, will be cleaned once a day and then have two visits or, or have housekeeping visit every two hours. So there'll be a, a visual presence there uh, of someone who will be cleaning the high touch areas. And then the common offices and other areas, we're going to schedule them based on building usage. Uh, we will not on the um, staff side even if we are in stage three, have full capacity back to campus of all the administration. So we are looking at those areas that won't be occupied and then um, revising their cleaning schedules and effectively pivoting those resources to clean uh, the other more heavily uh, uh, occupied areas. Next, dining services. So need to wear a mask unless you are eating. The dining locations are going to be set up for social distancing, including the markings, uh, as we talked about the floor decals. All the transaction areas will have shields, and the, but there won't be any uh, self-service food. Um, so Raymond Hall will be open, Port Cafe will be open, venues and the hours of operations are going to adjust accordingly. Um, due to our new uh, schedule. Um, you'll be able to dine limited dining arrangements at uh, Raymond Hall through social distancing, but we're asking people 
for self-serve or grab and go um, to go to go outside to find a, a spot outside of the building um, to have your meals or take it back to your room and then the uh, meals for those students who are in quarantine um, or isolation will bring them the meals and we will also remove the trash next transportation so face covering again required for students and the drivers the six students will be transported to medical care treatment through a third party transport agency or if necessary by calling an ambulance uh, the shuttle service will continue to just go to the local shopping centers uh, for students who need um, groceries or what have you for on-campus use the ventilation in the van will be circulate will be set to non-circulating and the windows will be open and down when it is when the weather permits uh, the maximum capacity that the van will operate at is four students and disinfectant wipes will be left on each row in the van for students to wipe down on their own um, so that the passengers can clean it before they get in, but also there'll be a full wipe down of the vehicle at the start of the shift, halfway through the shift and at the end of the shift. So in addition to the students doing it, there'll be three full um, wipe downs at the end of each shift. If you have any further questions regarding any of these areas that we talked about today and questions that we possibly may not get to this afternoon, feel free to email reopen at georgian.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. At this point, I would like to start our question and answer session using the questions that were submitted ahead of time. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Marbach. Um, are we returning to campus on August 24th? Uh, yes, we are. Um, Classes begin on the 24th of August, and um, if we are in stage two, they will be online classes. If we are in stage three, uh, they will be in person in the high flex mode that uh, Provost Warner and Dr. Rahill described earlier. The area immediately surrounding the GCU campus has been an epicenter of the coronavirus in New Jersey and continues to be affected. What is the option for students who feel unsafe about returning to on-campus classes for the fall? And can they attend all classes online if they are not comfortable attending in person? Yes, so we've taken steps to seal off campus. If you haven't visited campus, um, I would encourage you to come by and see it. We are, uh, have a gate around campus and we've sealed that so that the uh, only entrance is through our main gate, and we uh, have uh, our safety officers on duty there to ensure that only people with university business are permitted onto campus. So we're very concerned about the safety and welfare of our students, faculty, and administrators once on campus. But if a, if a student is concerned about driving to Lakewood uh, and they're not comfortable attending in class, in-person class, they will have the option through the high flex method of taking all their classes online. So, and, I, and there's a second question related to this, Tara, I know about being forced to attend class or that sort of thing. No student will be, atten will be forced to attend classes. Uh, we don't want students uh, who are uncomfortable uh, in, in certain circumstances to feel that they need to compromise their health or the health well-being of a member of their family uh, by putting by coming to class in person through high flex the real beauty and and value of high flex is that all the material will be online and students will be able to take those courses online now what if a student starts off taking in-person classes when available um, through the high flex um, program but decides at some point during the semester that they don't feel like they are comfortable continuing in person what would you say to that? That individual would then be able to shift to online. So it could be the real instant, instance where either person's not comfortable or perhaps they've come into contact with someone who has COVID-19 and they therefore need to quarantine for 14 days. Well, we don't want to lose 14 days of, of learning two weeks during the semester. 
that's too long of a period. So those students would be able to, sh to shift from those in-person classes, inform their instructor that now I'm gonna be taking the class online for 14 days or for the rest of the semester, whatever the time frame may be. Okay, and is our plan still to have on-campus classes until Thanksgiving and then go remote after that? Yes, that's still the plan if we're in stage three. So, um, and again, we're trying to remain as flexible as possible. Um, it's possible that during the semester, the governor could declare that we're in stage three and then October 15th, uh, there's an outbreak and we go back to stage two. Well, at that point, then we would move to online as of October 15th, um, and the rest of the semester would likely then be online. Great, thank you so much. My next set of questions are for Provost Warner. Uh, will classes be online only if the professor prefers? Uh, no. Um, so um, actually, before I answer these questions, I've been busy answering questions online. So if you did type a question, um, it's very likely that you can find the answer there. But to answer that specific question, um, everything related to the schedule is being done ahead of time. So if you have an in-person component on your schedule, um, the faculty member should not be saying, oh, okay, we're gonna go online instead. We, we've made all those changes ahead of time. What are uh, online classes gonna look like? And I know that you and Dr. Rayhill covered this um, during a presentation, but what are online classes going to look like for students who cannot, for health reasons, go physically to class during the semester if the class is also being offered in person? Yeah, so that's, that's hard to answer generically, um, and that's why Dr. Rahel was giving an example, because um, different faculty may do it differently. Um, that being said, as Dr. Rahel was saying, we've been doing a lot of training and providing a lot of support for different methodologies that are effective so that all students can, can um, continue to work on their classes. And so um, let me leave it at that, <laughs> but they should know that it won't, that they should find something there that will help them continue in their classes. It will be um, less likely that it'll just be, you know, a PowerPoint that would have been used in class. We, we've been working to really make sure that that would be enhanced in this case. Okay, um, I have a question here. If I'm staying home as per recommendation, then I'm not sure if that means that they are in quarantine or isolation or that they just don't feel comfortable coming for um, health reasons. Will they be permitted on campus for hybrid classes? Yeah, so if you're not supposed to be, if you're supposed to be staying home, then you should not be coming to class. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that question was a little confusing, but yes, if you're, if you've been recommended to quarantine, please, please do not come to campus. Okay. And if New Jersey remains in phase two and classes are online at the beginning of the semester, but then New Jersey moves to phase three in the middle of the semester, will classes move from online to hybrid or will students remain online? So our, our plan is that if New Jersey moves to stage three, we will move to stage three or in person. Um, a week after that um, announcement. When will the university announce if fall classes are definitely remote or hybrid? Will this announcement come directly before the start of the semester? Uh, some commuters are trying to figure out whether or not to purchase a parking pass. <laughs> yes, so we uh, plan to make an announcement of where we are on August 17th for the 24th. So if we're still in stage two and it doesn't look like stage three will happen before the 24th, on um, August, August 17th, we'll make sure that that is re-announced, that we're still in stage two and that we will start online. If New Jersey moves into phase three and classes are hybrid, when will students find out how and which day their classes will meet? So we've asked faculty to have their course outlines and announcements um, up by August 17th. How will hybrid classes work? Uh, if you have classes Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, Thursday, will hybrid classes be by the week? 
I'm not sure I understand that question, um, but basically all students should should be available during the time that's on the schedule. So, you know, don't, if you see Monday, Wednesday, 930 to 1045, make yourself available both those days and those times because that's what you've signed up for. And then um, just keep in contact with your professor who will tell you exactly what, what they plan to do. Will there still be uh, a maximum days missed in person per semester? Um, apparently, I guess usually there's, a, if you miss more than two or three days, you can't pass the course. Will that be waived this semester to discourage students from attending while feeling ill? Yeah, we've, we've asked faculty to be very flexible in their, um, in their attendance policy. That being said, they're gonna come up with other ways to make sure that students are staying um, in, engaged with the class. So there may be other requirements that replace um, attendance policies per se. Will students be given the option for pass fail for any classes this semester? It, it, it's not likely that pass fail will be allowed this semester. Um, it was brought in, in, it was put in place in the spring uh, semester because we were caught completely unaware. So we didn't know if students had the technology they needed. Um, we didn't know how well faculty were able to adapt to the new methodology. So there were so many things in play. We also, you know, we just didn't know many things. And so pass fail seemed like the, the best policy in that situation. For fall 2020, although many things are up in the air, we do know that classes will happen and that, that, that students need to, to maintain engagement in the class. So it is not likely that we'll put in a pass-fail uh, policy for, for fall 2020. I have a question from a parent who um, their son had signed up for classroom learning in the spring semester, but um, some of the faculty didn't do remote learning that they didn't meet for any classes or it, basically they were just given assignments to do at a certain time. How is How are faculty going to handle uh, making it different from independent study where there's actual faculty interaction. Yeah, again, I, I go back to um, in the spring, you know, everybody was caught unawares. And so people, people had different levels of, of ability or knowledge of how to bring a class online. And so it, it was true that not all classes had the same experience um, in the spring. That's different for the fall. We've, we've spent the whole summer when faculty really aren't um, obligated to work, but they have been spending the whole summer um, really thinking about their courses and how they're going to make them more effective for fall 2020. And so I don't expect that to be as much of an issue, but if students do find problems, then they should first reach out to their faculty member and, and, and voice their expectations for the class. And if they're not satisfied with that, reach out to their department chairs or program directors. Uh, the next set of questions I have are all regarding the nursing program. There were quite a number of questions. Are nursing students going to be able to have in-class lectures and attend clinicals on site? Yeah, so a lot of these questions came up online as well, and I, I responded to a lot of them there. But one of my main things is I really would like the nursing faculty to have a chance to engage with their students directly, and they've informed me that they're going to have a town hall next week just to address the nursing programs. In addition, I would refer you to our, our plan that we, we filed with the state. There are significant details about nursing in particular. Um, as a general response, they do plan to have clinicals. They do plan to have um, students in the nursing labs and in simulations. It will be in smaller groups, however. And so um, I just want to, they've worked very hard on their plans. And so I don't want to mischaracterize what they're doing. Um, but they are very concerned that their students have the, um, have the hands-on experiences that they need in order to be effective nurses in the future. So um, that is all going to be explained um, in their town halls. Okay, so I think that that general response, we will um, move on to the next sections since they will be um, given a lot more detail. Um, education students. Uh, they have a specific number of observation hours that um, where they're in, in classrooms. 
uh, that are required. How are those observations going to be handled and are they still going to be taking place? Yes, so um, observations are going to be mostly virtual. However, the um, clinical practices, the clinical placements will still be happening. And depending on the school district, it will either be uh, virtual or in person. And so a lot of that will depend on the actual placements. Um, but the education program is also working really hard and you really want to reach out to them specifically about your placements. And my second question about education students, uh, is there any truth to the rumor that the deadlines for the required praxis tests may be pushed off for education students? Um, if they originally had to have their praxis to in by December, does it still have to be in by then or will there be an extension? December, December 15th is still the deadline, but for, for some people that was a push off. So um, you can go to your part-time uh, clinicals in, in the fall even if you didn't finish your Praxis two, you have until December 15th, but you had to notify, you have to notify the education faculty. Um, the same with starting education classes um, or entering the education program in the fall. Mm -hmm. You do that even though you haven't finished the Praxis core exam, but you have to have those passed by December 15th as well. And you also had to notify the program directors. So there is still some leniency because those were hard to complete during the spring, but now um, they are becoming available either virtually or even in person to, to take those exams. So December 15th is still currently the deadline to get those done. Uh, related, but um, all of our students are required to have experiential learning experiences. If a senior is unable to obtain an internship during the fall term when they are required to have one, then is that the only time that they are offered? So um, we're, we've, we've done a lot of work with internships too. And again, I don't want to misspeak. So uh, the two places you should go is if it's a requirement to your program, contact the program director or department chair. And then CLO Callahan, our director of career services, has also come up with a very complete process for internships. So please reach out to career services as well. But, but the two places, you know, as, the, as far as the requirement goes, make sure your department, um, get guidance from your department, but also more specifically for the internship, you can reach out to CLO Callahan and, and the Department of Career Services in general. Um, I have a couple of questions about schedule changes. So that there were some, I guess there were some courses that were canceled or removed from schedules, in particular courses in visual and performing arts. And some of those courses from that category are required to meet the gen ed requirements. Um, are, are there going to be classes added to help fulfill those requirements? Because some of them are just not fitting into student schedules. Um, I would just, so, so courses that were canceled so far have pretty much been because they were under enrolled. So, um, the best advice is to contact your advisor and, and see what can be done. And if there is a groundswell for a need for a class, certainly the advisors will reach out to the departments and the dean and um, classes might be added. But in general, we were only canceling classes due to under enrollment at this point. Can a student schedule change because of the current COVID changes made to the school's reopening plan? Uh, this is coming from a student who has the schedule of being on campus for face-to-face -face classes only two days a week and online classes for the other days. Uh, can, can you repeat that question? I wasn't sure if I understood it. Sorry. Um, yeah, this one is a little confusing. I guess they're wondering, um, can their schedule change because they're usually only on campus two days a week. I guess I'm not really sure what this question is asking either. So, so I mean, part of what we did as far as the schedule goes is we really didn't change people's schedules, um, except that if you were in person, you're gonna be in person slightly less. So it shouldn't have, you know, if you were only planning to be on campus Tuesdays and Thursdays, that wouldn't have changed 
And in fact, maybe you'll only be on campus on Thursday. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, and, and that was done, you know, we, we had played with lots of different scenarios, including a scenario where, where everybody would have had to re-register and um, just decided that wasn't the best approach. So your, your schedule shouldn't have changed from what you originally had, except that you may be in person slightly less. I have two questions about commencement. Is graduation still going to be on time and are we going to have a ceremony in December? Okay, so December we never have a ceremony, so I'm not sure where that one's coming from. If you graduate in December, we never have a ceremony. You're invited to the May ceremony. Um, we hope that we can have May commencement. <laughs> we certainly would like to have May commencement. As far as a rescheduling of May 2020's commencement, we are looking at a series of uh, commencement ceremonies in October. But again, we're still surveying the whole situation as far as what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. Thank you so much, Provost Warner. I am now gonna put Dean Jennings on the hot seat. Uh, if a student chooses to stay at home this semester as recommended by GCU, am I guaranteed my housing placement in Mercy Hall when the campus opens back up as an honors student? So we um, cannot guarantee anything for the spring, particularly housing in Mercy. Uh, Mercy is the building that really the only building that we're able to use to take rooms offline for quarantine space because they have their own bathrooms. Um, and so we are uh, taking some rooms uh, offline for the fall. And because we don't know exactly what the spring is gonna look like, um, it's, it, it, we may be doing the same at that point. So I, I cannot offer any guarantees for occupancy and mercy, um, but, it is, it's, but that student would just be placed in another, in another building. And we are trying to still keep our honor students um, as one community as much as we can. Um, but just due to uncertainty as far as COVID is concerned, I, we don't know what the spring is going to look like. And if we have to take, continue to take rooms offline in Mercy, then we'll just have limited capacity within that building. If someone were, and I know you talked about this in your presentation, but if someone were to catch COVID-19 on campus, how would they need to quarantine themselves and where would they need to go to do so? Well, if, if a commuter student um, were to test positive for COVID-19, um, then that student would, um, would, for one, not be permitted to come on campus. And we would ask that student not to come on campus. Um, and that student at that point would be under the direction of their primary health care provider and or health services in terms of what they should be doing. Uh, but, but for someone who's tested positive, campus is the last place they should be. For a resident student, um, as I mentioned earlier, if they are unable to go home, um, then we will provide them with quarantine space on campus. As I just mentioned, we do have um, spaces that we've taken offline for the sole purpose of, um, of a student who needs to be isolated or quarantined. Okay, so this is actually a question I got in multiple variations from different students. If a commuter student has back-to-back -back courses or uh, with one in-person hybrid course and the other online, where on campus can they go to take the online course or vice versa? Is there, um, how, if they have two online courses and they're taking them from home, how are they to get to campus to take an in-person class that fo directly follows? Well, what we've done, our IT department has been working um, hard over the summer to uh, increase, uh, boost the Wi-Fi signal on campus. And so, as it has already been mentioned, there will be outside space that will be available for study and for lounging. And we are also identifying indoor space that will be um, available for students to, to, to lounge while maintaining social distancing guidelines. Um, and so whether or not, you know, whether permitting a student wants to sit outside and, uh, and take their class, if they want to sit in one of the indoor spaces that we have identified on campus, um, for their classes. Um, and this is, again, I'm assuming this is coming from a student or students who have a series of online classes back to back and then an in-person class. 
Um, so this, it sounds like this is a student who may want to be on campus during their online classes so that they can easily get to their in-person class. And whether or not that student wants to sit in their car, because again, we are looking to boost the Wi-Fi signal outside. And I know that um, there are, have already been students who choose to sit in their cars in between classes. The Wi-Fi signal should be better. There are gonna be other outdoor locations, like I said, available should a student wanna sit outside on a nice day and participate in their class. Um, and because there's gonna be limited occupancy on campus anyway, there should not be any issues with the student being able to park. Because um, we don't have a lot of parking issues already, particularly compared to some of the larger schools. So it shouldn't be a problem for a student to park close to that in-person class, you know, find a nice quiet place to um, indoor or outdoor to uh, participate in the virtual class and then get to their, to their in-person class in time. Um, that, that should not be an issue. If a student has uh, any kind of medical disability that um, puts them at health risk, such as an autoimmune disorder, um, and if they need refrigerated medications, do they, uh, how would they go, do they need to contact health services about storing these or um, what other plans do we have in place to protect those students with medical necessities? So I'll answer that question like this. If there is a student who has a condition that puts them at a higher risk of um, not only contracting the virus, but um, could make recovery especially difficult should they contract the virus, then they may want to consider whether or not they want to come on campus anyway. That, that's, that's a personal decision. Um, but if, you know, if there's someone who is, for whatever reason, immunocompromised, um, those are, that's a group that the CDC is, is identified as particularly high risk. And I would just say you may want to think about if, if being on campus is what you really want to do, especially since you can take classes online. Um, should that student come on campus, um, the first thing, I, and I'm assuming this, this student is probably, or these, a student in this situation has probably already done this, is to contact Residence Life to, um, to uh, apply for a medical single. So that would make sure, and again, we are trying, Residence Life is working hard to, to put as many students in singles as possible, but that's a student who would be, have a certain level of priority for a single, as opposed to someone who is not immunocompromised. As far as medication and being stored in the refrigerator, um, that is not my expertise. And my advice would be to contact your primary health care provider and or health services. Because um, I can imagine different medications require different types of storage. And, I, and, and, and that's not my field of expertise. So I would advise to contact the folks who know that. Um, and that can be your personal doctor or that can be our health services department. And they can walk you through whether or not um, the refrigerator, you know, that, that one would have in the room would be appropriate for that kind of storage. Um, and I think I know there were multiple parts to that. Did I get all of that? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yes. The student has a uh, health care directive and a power of attorney should he or she get sick. Would those policies be given to the Office of Health Services? How would they... Um, yeah, with, with, know about that. with any health related question for students, um, the contact, the point of contact is always health services. Um, they are permitted to, you know, deal with those types of confidential issues. They're all HIPAA trained. So for those kind of questions, um, the contact should definitely be health services and they can let that student, and that, that would be the office that would obtain those documents. Um, and any other questions that that student may have they can contact health services um, and they are working um, right now during these summer months and they're available to answer those kind of questions. Okay, and how are students going to access the required COVID-19 training video? Um, we are right now securing the, the videos that we're gonna be um, using to train um, for new students, freshmen and new transfers. Those training videos will be provided when they go through their virtual um, new student orientation. For returning students, 
um, there will be a similar video, a similar training video, uh, but we are, uh, it's likely that's gonna be provided through a separate vendor. Um, and so that will all be virtual, whether it's through a link that they'll get access to online, whether it's through Blackboard, um, they will all be provided to students virtually, um, but we're just still in the process of, of securing the uh, training for re returning students. New students will get it when they uh, log in for new student orientation. Thank you, Dean Jennings. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn our questions over to our CFO, Amy Bazio. Do we have her? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, this, you went over this quite at length in your uh, presentation, but how are you going to incorporate safety within the campus? If you could just provide a brief overview. Um, well, I guess there's a number of things. One uh, is the daily screening tool uh, that everyone is required to um, partake in, whether a commuter student, a resident, a uh, faculty or staff member. Uh, we're closing off various exits and entrances to the university to have the traffic flow through the security gate so we can uh, ensure that those people who are driving onto campus uh, will are, you know, appropriately on campus. Um, we have the work with the, uh, with the resident's life. If the student's not feeling well to reach out to the Office of Health Services. If we are uh, unfortunate enough to have a positive case, we will reach out to the Ocean County Health Department and let them know of that, and then they will initiate and continue with the contact tracing. Thank you. Uh, what is the protocol for cleaning measures? Um, well, what we have uh, arranged to do with Aramark uh, we are reallocating resources from uh, the uh, not occupied as heavily areas to uh, both the buildings, the academic buildings, the restrooms within those buildings, the residence halls, um, and, the, and the classrooms. So they will all get enhanced cleaning through uh, supplemental housekeeping services. So you will see individuals that will be in the buildings uh, with our mark uh, markings on their on their clothing, uh, and they will be doing uh, they will be doing the enhanced cleaning during the day. The restrooms will be uh, tended by a porter every two hours. There will be clan, um, sanitizing wipes for uh, the students and the faculty in each and every classroom, as well as hand sanitizer. Uh, so we're asking that everybody, uh, when they come in, take a wipe, wipe down your area, and then uh, when you leave the next class, we'll come in and do the same. Great, thank you. Uh, how are students, oh, I'm sorry, when, um, if the campus is closed, will the bookstore be open and available? So yes, the bookstore uh, will be open. We'll have limited hours the way we did this past spring. What we're working on right now is um, should we still be in stage two, August 17th, classes start the 24th, uh, how do we get the books to the students? Because when March, when we closed, you had all the materials you needed. Now um, you wouldn't have the opportunity to get on campus. So we're working with the bookstore right now to see whether that's a curbside pickup or if we get them uh, shipped directly to you. So we're working on that. How will students obtain their student IDs? Um, we've just decided, uh, I guess in the past week or so, that and there'll be a communication going out to the students. If you need a new ID, there's going to be a process uh, where you would uh, upload your picture and then um, the, uh, the ID would be created. If you're a resident student, then they will be given out to you during move-in days through Residence Life. And if you're a commuter student, um, we would mail those to you. If 
the campus is closed, will they will students be refunded parking? Campus is closed. I, they would be, I, I'm sure, prorated on how long the campus uh, would be closed, but we're keeping our fingers crossed. How uh, will students, workers doing work study still be able to have their jobs on campus? Well, again, it'll depend what stage we're on, assuming we're in stage three. What happened during the spring term was federal work study students were, con were permitted to continue to uh, work, I say in air quotes, because they were still getting paid through the federal government, even though they actually weren't showing up on campus because all the campuses were closed. Um, so we haven't gotten to that point yet, hopefully. Um, if there comes to be such a situation with federal work study, that would come through again, but that was a government regulation or government um, mandate. Uh, as far as college work study with no federal uh, support through that, it will depend on um, the office's needs and um, what the operating, uh, what the operating uh, circumstances are for each, each area, for each office. Uh, can I add, add that we do have some virtual uh, federal work study positions being developed. So there will be some virtual um, work study that can be done as well. It's just that you, you need to be a New Jersey, you need to be residing in New Jersey to take advantage of those. Thank you. I will say that uh, particularly my office is going to be having a virtual work study so that they don't have to come into the office. Um, a lot of what our assistants do, um, they can be done virtually. Uh, and I have one last question for you, Amy, from the uh, questions submitted ahead of time. I know we have some other questions in the chat and Q&A. How will scholarships be impacted for students that obtain academic scholarship? For academic, for the merit scholarships? You know, yeah. we would, under stage two or stage three, we uh, there's there's no impact to them. We would honor uh, the merits, continue to honor the merit scholarships. What about sports scholarships if collegiate sports are canceled? Um, we're working right now with uh, athletics department to review um, uh, what uh, the uh, athletic scholarships are. But for this year, my uh, sense would be we would continue to honor those scholarships as well. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Okay, Janice, uh, I have a student who's still on the wait list for one of my online classes, even though I'd set up my classes over a month ago. Should I wait to get accepted to the class or choose another class before school starts? Sorry, I thought I answered that one. That was online, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I, I mean, it's really up to you. If there's open sections, I would probably choose another section. It is possible you might get off the wait list, but um, as in any year, it's not clear whether you will or not. So if there is a section that's a good alternative, just, just choose that one. Uh, will there be a water bottle filler in the wellness center installed? I don't know if Amy or Janice wants to handle, handle that one. We were just talking about water bottles fillers this morning, so I think we'll add that to our list of places to consider, but we certainly want to add some water bottle, fill bottle fillers elsewhere. <laughs> Are professors required to record lectures or Zoom calls? No, they are not required to, to um, record them. They have all the technology available if that's how they're going to teach their classes, but they're not required to, to record them. The hybrid plan is what exactly, is there a specific schedule? That was pretty much your whole presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, more than, I'm more than happy to answer anybody's questions. So if it, if it was confusing, um, please reach out and either I'll answer or I'll have somebody else attempt to answer. Uh, our class is already up on Blackboard because I'm not able to see mine. Not yet. They usually come up um, about a week before classes start. 
Um, that, that's, that's important because if faculty need time to start putting their material up and putting a, a, a final course outline up. So you don't want access too early. So look for it you know, around August 17th. You should start seeing everything populated in Blackboard. Uh, a student is supposed to be student teaching this fall semester, but they haven't heard anything about it yet. Uh, do we know if we will still be able to student teach in person whatsoever? Yeah, um, so again, I, that sort of depends on the placement, but reach out to the education department. Um, and I'm sure they're going to be reaching out to you as well soon. I mean, a lot of, a lot of decisions really have to wait moment by moment. Many school districts haven't put their plans forward yet. So, um, you know, it's not always because people haven't take, taken your question seriously. It's, it's because we often don't know the answer yet as well. So please just reach out to the program. I'm sure they'll get back to you with exactly what your placement is. Unmute. Uh, Dr. DePonte, will there be masks? All there. Yes, there will be masks. And um, we are right now working out where we will be having masks and when, um, because um, the chapel space will also be used as a classroom space. There will be times when mass will be offered in the St. Stephen's Chapel in the mansion, but all of that will be um, uh, announced uh, along with the, the schedule of um, other events from campus ministry. Thank you. Uh, so that we are being charged fees for stuff that we aren't using. I assume maybe like the fitness center or other student activities. I'm not sure exactly what fees the student was referencing, but, but even though we are likely not going to have a full on campus experience, we are still providing student programming and activities. Um, so much of what we're what we would provide on campus overall, um, we are still looking to provide virtually. Um, and thank God the technology exists that allows us to do that. But again, I'm not sure what fees this student may have been referencing. Are there any, are there going to be any adjustments to internship requirements during this time? Janice? Um, again, I would uh, reach out to the to your particular program, but in general, no. Um, there, there, there is plans to help you um, figure out either how to get an internship or to do something virtually, or in some cases um, to do something that's an alternative. Um, but again, that's really a program specific question um, as far as the requirements go. Uh, I have a student who's it says that their biology lab is online on self-service. How could labs be online? So labs can be online in many different ways. So we've um, uh, gained access to simulations. Um, faculty members are doing demonstrations and faculty members are doing demonstrations and then providing data. And so part of doing labs is looking at the data and doing the analysis associated with that. So there's a variety of ways that we um, are meeting the lear learning objectives virtually. If other students decide not to attend in person, will the students willing to attend be offered to go to campus in person? Yeah, if there's, if there's an in-person session, it'll, it will still happen. Um, if you're the only person who chooses to come or five people come or nine, all the, the full nine come. Um, the intent is to continue to have that in-person session. And I know you answered this during your presentation, but will in-person classes be recorded or live streamed for students who choose or need to stay home for online? 
Yes. So again, that's going to depend on the faculty member, and it has to do with the pedagogy and how they're teaching the class. So for some of the activities that they're doing in person, it doesn't really work if they're also trying to, um, they're, they're not lecturing, so the, the, the recording doesn't really work. But if they're doing a lecture, there is a camera available in the classrooms and they can make that available for students to watch either later or at the same time via streaming. If we don't move to stage three by the time we return back to school, will nursing students still attend clinicals or will everything be online? It, so we have a waiver for the nursing program to operate during stage two. And so there will be some in-person piece no matter what, whether they're stage two or stage three for nursing. And will Dean Jennings or President Marbach be attending the nursing town hall meeting? I feel it is important to have their attendance in this meeting. I was not invited to that meeting, um, but if I get invited, I certainly uh, clear out my schedule to attend. Same for me, I would love to, to attend. Great. Uh, If I am going to stay completely online, can I cancel my parking pass? Amy? Uh, yes, certainly. And another parking pass question, are they still being mailed to our home addresses when we register online? This student hasn't received theirs yet. You're muted. Okay, let me try that again. Um, I'm happy to look into that for you. You could either send the question to reopen at georgian.edu um, or you could send it to me personally and, and I will look into that with parking. Dean Jennings, how are we able to make socially distanced and safe events with mass sworn and limited people for clubs and organizations? I was, I was just trying to type in the response to that question. Um, that's all be, it will be based on the guidance issued by the state. Um, the governor issued just today some new guidance on uh, capacity limitations for indoor um, events. Um, and so for, for things like that, we are not um, making those decisions on our own. We will follow the guidance that is provided to us um, by the state and the CDC, and that's how we will function. But again, that's if we're at stage three and we're able to have on-campus events. We would love to do that. But I do want to stress that, you know, we're not going to risk the uh, safety of our students, um, you know, to have on-campus events. So we will do that on a limited basis and when we are able to do so safely. I have a student who has a Chromebook and has had some issues with compatibility, specifically with taking supervised tests online. Will there or have there been any changes to the system requirements? Dr. Warner? Um, I know Chromebooks may not always work with some things like our lockdown browser, but I don't know the specifics. I think they should contact the help desk. And um, the help desk will then reach out to our instructional technology, technology folks for the best answer. Amy, uh, I know you went over this a couple minutes ago, but how are students going to obtain their student IDs? Uh, so for, for new students uh, that are residents, you upload your picture and you'll be sent out a communication. You upload the picture, the, the ID will be made. It will be given to Residence Life and you will get it through Residence Life more than likely when you check in. For commuter students, you can upload the picture and then we will mail that to your home address. Okay, and the last question I have on the Q&A is, what about needing desk space or a computer? I guess if a student, uh, maybe a commuter student needed a space to study uh, when they were on campus. Um, so we're, we're setting up, 
we're setting up lots of outdoor space, um, which will definitely work for the first several months. Many of that space is in places where there are overhangs or protection. Um, in addition, the library will be open um, in a, on a limited basis for, for students to use. And we will have um, some of the computer stations there. Um, after that, we're, we're going to take a look at the schedule and the spaces that may still be open and um, designate some space that students can go to in between. But, but we're, we're going to take some time with that. We're really hoping that students use the outdoor space first because it's safer in any case to spend more time outdoors versus indoors. And that is, is being set up um, along with the uh, Wi-Fi that will be enhanced outside. Um, and so, you know, worse, worse comes to worse, as, as, the, as Dean Jennings was saying, you might also be able to use your car because Wi-Fi to the parking lots will be stronger. Okay, I'm just looking over in our chat to see if there are any questions that haven't been answered. Uh, I have a question about students who are, are in the exercise science program, will there be a clinical portion open to those students? Um, uh, I can't answer that definitively. I mean, I do know that exercise science in particular does like to um, do things in person because of the physical nature of the major. Um, so I think they had some ideas about going outside and doing certain things, um, but there aren't specific clinicals for exercise science. So um, clinicals, not per se, but I believe that some lab-like in-person um, sessions will, will happen. Okay, I think that is a good majority. Oh. I just wanted to say thank you to the 62 people who held on. I mean, these were amazing questions, and Dr. Marbach is going to close us out, but we've answered 101 questions, not to count the ones that you already talked about. Um, if there was anything I wanted people to leave with today was the importance of communication, reading, watching, sharing verified information. Uh, I think one of the lessons learned during this whole pandemic has been that we have to over-communicate. So if you have good information to share, please share it. And so with that, uh, Dr. Marbach or other cabinet members. Um, uh, now I'm unmuted, I think. Thank you, Gail. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the uh, participation of our audience and the questions that came through. Um, we tried to answer them throughout the presentation and, and beyond. Uh, I know many of us spent a lot of our time typing away, uh, trying to get to the answers. We don't know all the answers at this point. We do need to remain flexible. Um, this is a period of great uncertainty, and we've heard that time and time again. So uh, I think what you are seeing on our behalf is a good faith effort to meet the needs of our students. That's always our top priority. Um, we've been working with faculty they have many concerns about coming back into the classroom. I know many of our students have concerns about coming back into the classroom. But again, I would reiterate that our in-person classes only take place when we move to stage three. And stage three means that the transmission rate is lower, the hospitalization rate is lower, the infection rate is lower, that in general, it's a, the conditions are safer for that kind of activity. So um, please, Bear that in mind and we'll try to continue to answer your questions. If you have other ones that have come up after uh, this closes, you can send those once again to reopen, R-E-O-P-E-N, reopen at georgian.edu. Uh, you can send an anonymous question to me at my, on my president's suggestion box, which is available on our homepage at the website. We have a drop down box for that. Um, and this, uh, town hall meeting and uh, several of the presentations will be available on our website and that's georgian.edu slash reopen 2020 where you'll be able to view this town hall and those questions and the slides tomorrow when they're uploaded. So again, thank you to all who participated. My thanks in particular to uh, members of the leadership team 
who fielded these questions and thank you for giving us some ideas about where we need to fill in some of those gaps. Please take care of yourselves, stay safe, stay strong, and God bless.